Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of books that I read this month that would very clearly qualify for the disability readathon that was happening this month. This readathon is not over because it lasts for all of October, but I thought in part I'd do this early because then if you hadn't heard about it, you could see if any of your reading over the next week qualify and join in the fun, and also because I didn't want to do all the editing that would be associated with doing a reading vlog of the stuff that I read on my trip, because I have footage for that, but I'm too lazy to edit it. So the first thing that I picked up is the essay collection About Us. This compiled a group of essays that were published in the Disability series in the New York Times, some of which I had read already, but the majority of which I had not. This, I think, is unique among disability-themed collections, not just of essays, but often of short stories and poetry as well, in that there isn't a single unifying uh, perspective on or theory of, if you prefer, disability within here. There are people who are coming at it from more of a social or a medical model. There are people who are still adjusting to changes in identity. And there are people across the age spectrum and from a variety of class and ethnic backgrounds as well. The title obviously comes from the nothing about us without us phrase that you hear used quite a lot in disability circles. And yeah, normally with a collection like this I would expect a certain unevenness just because I think with such a wide variety of authors you expect that not all of them are going to connect with you. But I thought as a collection, because it had so many different perspectives, I thought this worked quite a lot better than it did if it had one unifying principle linking them all because I think in that case you would probably be going in either agreeing or disagreeing with the particular perspective and would have to judge everyone according to how well they fell in with that. And because this has so much variety to it, uh, I didn't feel like that was true. So I was pretty impressed with this, although, although if I do have a critique it would be a lot of them are clearly uh, introductory 101 type presentations of situations. But unfortunately I think that's something that's still generally needed, so I don't think that's necessarily a negative in terms of a broader audience. So yeah, I was very impressed with this and I didn't mind rereading even the essays that I had read previously. Next up I picked up a young adult novel and that was This Is Not a Love Scene by S.C. Meagle. This is a book that could have done a couple of really interesting things, but instead it doesn't commit to being either a teenage romantic comedy or a teenage raunch comedy. And because it doesn't commit to either one, it ends up with a lot of scenes that are cringy because they're pushing the sex comedy bit in this charming teenage story, or they're going for sentimentality immediately after a raunchy bit and it's it's just a weird tone. The main plot in here is that this 18 year old in her last year of high school is working on a film project which seems to be better funded than <laughs> most high school projects I can imagine would be but in any case they've hired an actor and she when we're dealing with the romantic comedy side it seems like she wants to have a relationship with him when they're dealing with the raunchy part she just wants to have sex with him. <laughs> the beginning and the end of the book focus on the sex part, the middle kind of falls into the romantic comedy side, which doesn't flow together well, which I think is a shame because one of the things that's interesting about this is that I think a lot of teenage romance stories fall a little too hard on the true love side, whereas in this one she has her options and she knows they're not perfect and that the guys that she's considering don't necessarily see her for herself, they have their own issues that they're dealing with and so as a result she's aware that it's not some true love situation and I thought that was great. I also thought it was fun that a character who's as overtly sexual as this one, which you normally see as a teenage boy and generally a kind of conventionally fit teenage boy and side character in a story that is the raunch comedy, whereas in this one she's the central character, she's female, she has muscular dystrophy, and there is commentary in here about how socially she is desexualized by society and what that means for her ability to have conquests or have a romance because again the book doesn't know where it wants to go on that. There are also extraneous subplots in here. There is a weird mystery plot about a woman who may or may not be stalking her that's completely separated from the rest of it. Weird side character bits about her old man friends which it doesn't really go anywhere and it's a little odd. 
Uh, there is also a side potential love interest who ends up being suicidal and that's dealt with in a really glib way. There was potentially some promise in this but it just needed a couple more rounds with an editor I think to get rid of the extraneous stuff and decide which of these two frameworks they want the main plot to sit on because uh, it just didn't quite work. Which is a shame because I think it had the potential to do something really different but instead it was just a bit sloppy. Changing genres completely once again I read The Body Is Not An Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love by Sonia Renee Taylor. This is a book that I saw a number of people talking about on Twitter, Instagram, I'm not sure, somewhere on social media a number of months ago and my library hold just came in. This book is essentially a guide to, as it says, self-love, self-acceptance, embracing the true self, I guess, for people whose bodies lie outside the conventional what's conventionally seen as the norm or the beauty standard, whether that's in terms of weight or race or gender presentation or disability. The author talks about how she came up with the title when she was talking to a friend with CP who had an unexpected pregnancy because she felt like after she'd been in a semi-casual relationship where she felt that because she'd had to do so much explanation of disability she didn't want to push the safe sex part. And in response to that the author made this point that uh, one's body should not be something that you have to apologize for. And this is essentially a discussion of that way of looking at body issues or body perspective and then a guidebook towards uh, how one could achieve that. So it's very, it's a little too self-helpy for my normal standard but I did enjoy reading about the perspective piece and where she came up with the idea. There's a whole website with articles on this now so if I remember I will link to it below. As a self-help book I thought it was good enough. It wasn't cr as cringeworthy as a lot of self-help books are so I appreciated that aspect. The one thing that I thought was a little sloppily done in this is that there are a number of entertaining factoids that are included that are often I think not fact-checked. There's one point in here where she comments on Queen Hatshepsut taking power in 1503 and I sat there and went that is 3,000 years too late. Queen Hatshepsut was born in 1503 BCE. She did not take power in 1503 common era, right? There's another bit where she's using a metaphor regarding native language as being a perspective thing which it, and she says if you'd grown up francophone your first word might have been mare instead of mama. It's like well no that would be mother and mama is mama, right? So I thought there were some things like that where again which I think is an editing issue. Somebody should have caught that before this was published in both of those cases. Those complaints aside I did think this was quite good for what it was trying to do but again where is the editor to catch this? Uh, next up I read some trashy romance because I realized it had been a long time since I had read one and that was The Most Expensive Night of Her Life by Amy Andrews. This was something that I originally was not going to read because the female love interest is a supermodel and normally any celebrity character in either romance or mystery if it's played straight and not played as a joke irritates me to no end. However most of this takes place on a houseboat and I love a good houseboat setting so I read this anyway and it turned out that this also worked for the readathon because the male love interest is an amputee and unlike some romance novels which will take disability elements and turn it into a Beauty and the Beast retelling which you know it can be a little iffy. This is not that. Uh, the woman is dealing, it does work through the man's issues but this is because he's ex-military and he watched his brother-in-law die. He's not dealing with emotional anguish because of disability. He wears a prosthesis and she's surprised by that and there's some discussion about how their sex positions are going to work. Although I don't think the author thought through all of them because there's one sex scene where he doesn't take off his prosthesis and he's an above knee amputee and the position that they describe I'm sure was not comfortable for either of them. But I don't know is that too much information? It might be. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, but in any case uh, it's not a Beauty and the Beast style story which I find cringeworthy when one of the characters is disabled. So. And it wasn't nearly as cringy on the celebrity paparazzi stuff although obviously there is some of that but less than less than I feared and there was plenty of you know riding this houseboat up and down the Thames and that was fun. I wasn't a hundred percent the reason it's called the most expensive night of her life is because the woman bribes this man more or less 
into staying with her while she's hiding from the paparazzi by giving a big donation to his sister's charity. And the charity is a military veterans charity and the language around a lot of the military stuff is a little iffy. I think it's a lot of this heroism and all of that, which is never really explored deeply, which I always find a little iffy when we're talking about uh, any situation in which you have people in a volunteer military situation, like in the UK, and, and then is fetishized without really looking at the political ramifications of that, which you see in a lot of, more so in US romances, but also in some UK ones like this. So I found some of that a little mm, politically naive, but I think discussing pil <laughs> like politics in a fluffy romance novel is perhaps the wrong way to look at it. That might be expecting too much from a category romance, which let's be honest, I don't think most of us go into those expecting serious commentary. Although I'd love to know if you have read something that is not a literary romance, but an actual pulpy category romance that you thought had great social commentary. I'd love to know what it was and how the commentary worked. In any case, because I was thinking about those elements, I ended up rereading uh, Harry Parker's Anatomy of a Soldier. I read this when it first came out a couple of years ago and I was just blown away by it. It is stylistically still really interesting, although it seems a little bit more gimmicky on rereading just because I knew what to expect. This is a novel, which is one of those lightly novelized memoirs, but the sort of gimmick or the stylistic choice here is that every chapter is narrated by a different item. So there's an item that's narrated by fertilizer that's going to be made into a bomb. There is a, a chapter that's narrated by a urinary catheter. There is a chapter that's narrated by one character's shoes and then the next one is narrated by another character's boots. The two characters in this are a 20-something British army captain and a 16-year-old Afghan insurgent. And the chapters are not only narrated by the stuff, but they are told they're out of order. In interviews, the author has said you can read them in any order. It is definitely very non-linear. And it's not a spoiler to say that the Afghan teenager dies, the British guy loses both of his legs and goes back to the UK and gets on with his life. And what I appreciated about this is because the, the actual author, who is also a former British army captain who lost his legs in Afghanistan and you know, went on to write this book, is that at least he's trying to balance the politics of both being somebody who's in a volunteer military situation by having this other character. I don't think it's 100% successful in that sense, but I appreciate the effort when so many writers go into that without even trying. And I do think the style is fantastic. I will link below to the video in which I talked about that originally. Um, if you want to hear me talk about that more, which you might not. As usual, I was listening to an audiobook, and the one that I was listening to is Nicole Chung's All That You Can Ever Know. No one actually has a disability in this, but the disability connection here is that when she was adopted, the adoption was pushed through very quickly because she was born prematurely and her parents and the system were concerned that she would be disabled. And because of that, this adoption went through very quickly. So there is interesting commentary about that. In addition, some of the reason that her biological parents decided to put her up for adoption may or may not have been because of the costs associated with medical care in the US. So there's uh, a bit of that in the background as well. So I thought that commentary makes it still fit. This is Nicole Chung's memoir of mostly of her experience growing up in this adopted family and then finding her birth family in the same year that she had her first child. And her story ends up dealing with a number of different issues, which are both the complexities of her family left Seattle when she was quite young and grew up in a semi-rural area where she was not only the only Asian, but virtually the only person who wasn't white, and what that meant for her growing up with parents who weren't equipped to deal with that, in part because the adoption culture of the early 80s was adoption experts of the time discouraged her parents from making those kinds of points and having those kinds of discussions. And so the early part of the memoir seems like it's going in the direction of her birth parents should have been supported more either financially or just generally socially to be prepared to raise 
a child who might have had medical issues. But then we find out that her biological mother had been abusive and that her biological father eventually divorced her, but her sister had been abused, had been abused growing up. And one of the points is that if this hadn't been considered a special needs adoption, there would have been more investigation into both families and something might have happened to kind of rescue her biological sister earlier from this abusive situation. And then it goes on to talk about her developing relationship with her biological sister and father and the complexities of the fact that she's not really in contact with the biological mother. So it's an interesting situation, but the book itself I think is probably about twice as long as it needs to be. A lot of it gets a bit repetitive. And I realize from a marketing standpoint, more people will buy something that looks clearly like a book as opposed to something that looks like it's an essay that's been bound. So uh, I appreciate why that choice must have been made, but it does make it feel a lot more slight than I think it should because she is talking about a number of really interesting issues to deal with in connection with each other. Because I think with adoption, a lot of people want it to be either all good or all bad. And, and this situation makes it clear that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, also, I feel like this might have been better to read versus to listen to because normally I prefer listening to memoirs at, when they are read by the author as that she doesn't do an interview, so that's not just her natural way of talking. So because of that, I almost wish I'd read it instead of listened to it, but I didn't, so there we go. Those are the books that I've finished so far. I do have a couple of other books with disability themes that I am working on that'll pop up in another wrap up, but we'll talk about those another time. If you are participating in the Disability Readathon, I would love to hear what you've read and what perspective the books you were reading were approaching disability from. Is that a proper sentence? I'm not sure. Um, in any case, and if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. Uh, that's it for now. Ciao.